Hey Charles, good uh, morning. I guess it's good morning for you. Yeah, I, as I assume you are calling in from the UK, right? I, I am from the middle of nowhere, although I talk about cities all the time, but that's life. Amazing. So, hi, how are you doing today? How's how's your I'm day? I'm fine. Uh, I'm fine because the weather's broadly fine, so that makes you feel awake. Nice. Yeah, in Berlin, it's been a bit sticky. I mean, I'm almost like I'm from Sao Paulo, you know, I'm like used to this a bit of like sticky weather, but like, oh, this summer has been tough I, even for me here in, in Europe. So, yeah. yeah. So, yes, I mean, super nice to have you here. And I guess, yeah, this is just a free, free flow conversation, but I have I do have some some questions and want to understand. I mean, I just try to kind of put my spend some time trying to understand all the things that you all the topics that you touched upon in your life and all the initiatives that you did. And those are many and they're all like across this sort of like, uh, yeah, urban, like the, the redefinition of urban space, understanding cities, understanding this creative economy. And also like you're talking all about also this like emerging nomadic world. And you like, there is the creative bureaucracy, like uh, hacking, hacking the laws and figuring out like, so I really think that you are like, and I really liked reading in your website about yourself that you really define yourself as like this sort of like use of imaginations. So I think like the idea of expanding the imaginarium of something, I think it's a very beautiful idea. And uh, I think certainly that's a good way to see, like you just basically see a future see some indications of what it's happening and you're able to like help the collective to expand the imaginarium of this future and make it and put it on the uh, uh, bring it to the ground or make it tangible for others to understand and so i think that's really fascinating and i wanted to understand how how was this journey for you to get to all of those uh, all those insights and processes well, you know, one always has to start from where one comes from and, and, and where I come from. My, my parents were German. They escaped from the Nazi. And then after the war, they had me uh, as an afterthought. But already my parents were a bit bohemian. Um, a, a, an author wrote a big article about my father. He was called Harold. Harold Landry, the last bohemian and his friends group in Berlin. And that was sort of the end of the Weimar Republic and then into the 30s. So probably that affected me a bit, you know, to, to try and look a bit sideways and things like that. And so in the end, ultimately, I was interested in, in two things. How do alternatives shape themselves up? What is What are the other voices that we don't hear about? So I've always been interested in trying to bring those out. And when I was quite young, after my first job, which sounds very fancy, I worked for an ex-government minister in the EU, speculating on a project which was called Europe Plus 30. So that was possibly influential. But then I made a sort of switch into the, I suppose, the alternative world. And then with others, set up a distribution company of all the sort of then alternative types of news that existed, first feminist publications, environmental ones, and all of that. So that really shaped me. But then when I left that organization, I set up my own organization that at the time was called Comedia. And Comedia meant communicating across media, whichever way you want to look at it. But I also like the idea that People sometimes thought, hey, are you being a joker or something? Is this a comedy? But my view was, look, everything's serious, but let's be relatively lighthearted. But what that then led to over time was really doing a series of explorations. And quite soon what came up was this notion of creativity. And my interest in creativity was meeting so many people who weren't fulfilling their potential. Now, I could have focused on individual creativity or organizational creativity. But in the end, what I liked about cities was that they were just simply so complex and you had to align different forces, different attitudes and so on. And so that became really uh, my thing. And, you know, as time developed, you use slightly different language. So today you would say, what's the ecosystem of, of, of cities like? 
But within that, what I was always trying to do was to stretch the boundaries. And what I mean by stretching the boundaries was to look at the blind spots in the way people think, plan and act. And if we look at cities, just as an example, you know, we talk about urban planning, urban development and all of that. And then you look at who are the people involved in that. And they're often physical planners who look at things from the air rather than from the ground, you know, the real life of the city and so on. And then in looking at that a bit, there seem to be some blind spots. One, we weren't necessarily encouraged to, to use the imagination. So you could say that is one thing. And in one sentence, a sort of fat book the creative city a toolkit for urban innovators says in a world of dramatic change how do you create the conditions for people to think plan and act with imagination in solving problems and creating opportunities but then over time other sort of blind spots were pretty clear and to me cultural knowledge understanding where people come from who they are all of this sort of thing is really the superior lens in understanding how economics works. You know, economics in Japan is different from the US or uh, uh, or Germany and Britain. And so the cultural literacy aspect is to me really important, which is really how do you decode, interpret, get the idea of where a person comes from. Now, the link between culture and creativity, and I'm using the word culture in a bigger way, wider way, is that creativity is a renewable resource, endlessly renewable. And then the cultural thing is sometimes a bit more sticky. And particularly some manifestations of culture, like cultural heritage, are not necessarily renewable, although you can reinterpret what they are. So the cultural lens was really important. And within that, then asking, I ask myself, well, what is the specific contribution, culture in a narrower sense, the arts forms can do to I, help us develop as a place, give us all sorts of things. And, you know, great cultural policy, you know, is obviously about empowerment, entertainment, um, insight, enlightenment, and all of those things. Another widening thing I had was this notion of psychology in the city. Now, given that our first experience is really the perception of place, how do we feel? What, what does it do to us? Does this place say yes or no? And this, again, this knowledge about psychology is not really at all embedded in the way cities are thought about, how people plan, projects they do, and so on. And finally, just to come to the point you mentioned earlier about the creative bureaucracy, when I was looking at cities broadly as an ecosystem, initially, perhaps I focused a bit on the arts because, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you know, there were lots of places declining in Europe everywhere. Industry was fading away. And so what people might have had is sort of a good, vibrant art sector. And I felt then at the time that that could make a big contribution. But as you know, there's social innovation, there's business innovation and so on. But one aspect that was really forgotten is that the public administration is always in one way or another involved in how places work. And here I wanted to recapture the positive sides of the bureaucracy and i'm using the word creative bureaucracy obviously as a pro provocation bureaucracy sounds boring dull creativity sounds so exciting you know what i mean and uh, the message i was trying to throw out is those people who are working in these institutions of which there are tens of millions in europe they're not all stupid many of them are trying to do good things for the public good and for the public interest. And so what that led to, and initially when I had the idea in 2003, people thought it was completely crazy. And it was only when I wrote a book with my friend Margie Korst that there was some sort of physical reality. And from that uh, developed a big event, which is called the Creative Bureaucracy Festival. So that gives you a bit of a 
a little trajectory may or may not be useful. I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, you know, uh, today I'm uh, going to have another conversation with Evangelos, who is uh, running the Heritage Management Foundation, and they're all about looking at heritage and also cultural heritage. And we've had lots of conversations about what is also intangible heritage, right? And I really think it's super interesting how how this like a sort of meta way of how you look at at the world and it's like very modern i guess like as you said this whole idea of ecosystem building and kind of maybe comes from the startup world more like in this uh, utilitarian startup world sort of silicon valley culture that then spread out into this like mainstream thinking but i guess this is quite i mean it is quite a I think a new thing that people just try to understand that you have to create the conditions for something to happen rather than just force things to happen and how you kind of have to look into this like very yeah this multi-layered sort of like complex systems that then only by activating those conditions you are able to get the results that are that are re actually really good and I think you're able to capture that that understanding very early and in your in your in your books or in your writing and also in your thought processes and i think this is also very valuable also for bridging the understanding to policymakers right on like the, it's almost like you're looking at the city as this sort of individual itself right it's a sort of like collective body that is emerging and that is kind of changing and i think this is yeah this is really a very yeah mo modern and very very uh, interesting way of looking at it and i guess i guess like uh, i mean just to the creative bureaucracy as well i mean i mean i've been involved in processes of like uh, really hacking the bureaucratic system a bit like creating different ways like you don't have this legal structure then you create the foundation that then has a veto right on the other legal structure that doesn't allow it to change something, then suddenly you have another legal structure, right? All of these ways of looking. And I mean, in Brazil, as where I grew up, uh, we have a word called jeitinho. I'll send you the Wikipedia. Uh, uh, there is a Wikipedia in English about this, but it's basically, it's called little way. And little way is very funny because it's a word that means for mainly for the people that are um, not... Uh, having access to a lot of wealth, it means the only way they can survive, right? They need to be creative and they need to find a way around things to, to do this. But it could also be like uh, crashing into a party or finding an opportunistic thing or like even getting into... And then when it gets more to people that have wealth, the same word means more like corruption or like using, bending the system for your own advantage, right? And I find that word really, really fascinating because it's just like... It's just like the same word that means so different things, but also it's fundamentally, it's fundamentally that, right? It's like, which I think is a beautiful thing in, in this culture of like not looking at reality as a, as a, as a fixed uh, thing. And it's just like, okay, there's always a way you can find a solution to that. And I think obviously in this emerging world of Brazil or of like, or like emerging market or however you want to say it, it is kind of the way we need to do things because things are not really as stable or, or established as here. But I think it's really interesting that that kind of like wisdom or whatever, the kind of ways of thinking, you're just taking that and applying this into some sort of like policy making environment and like encouraging people to understand that that that's also a way and that you can build some sort of community around this so that that this eventually leads to to the actual change. And I think that's a really, really, really interesting initiative in that sense, yeah. Well, I mean, just picking up a couple of points you're just making there. I mean, firstly, um, a city, a place, is is clearly a, a, a dynamic organism in some way. It's, it's not so fixed all the time. And seeing that organic approach leads you very much to the notion of ecological thinking, which is also about interconnection, that everything is interdependent and inextricably interwoven. So 
seeing this weaving together is obviously very difficult for our mind because we obviously like fixed points. Now, I'm not saying when people talk about, for example, the creative city, I'm firstly not saying that the creative city has an end result. What I'm saying, it's a process of always being alert, being willing to reassess things and think afresh. Now, some of the things that are happening, you might say, I've thought about them afresh, but they're still good. But it's providing that that enabling environment. So really, um, uh, what the Creative City is, is a culture of possibility, um, or it's trying to generate an, a, a culture of possibility. And that has then a number of dimensions. One of them, once you talk about possibility and things like that, you begin to ask, hopefully, that there are lots of people who might and should have possibilities and should be part of, let's say, this making, shaping, co-creating of the emergent, evolving place. Now, again, because uh, public administrations or bureaucracies like, obviously, structures which are sort of fixed and stable... I'm not against that at all, but just as I said earlier, provide yourself with the opportunity to allow other inputs to come in before always saying this is the way we did things and this is the way we always want to do it. One of the shifts, as you well know, is that too much we've been thinking in terms of sectors, you know, I don't know, uh, the public, the private, academia, the civic world. Now, clearly... All of these have certain attributes, criteria for success and failure and assets. And I'm just saying, and this is uh, often something that has become very common, Jeff Malden, for example, talks a lot about it, which is about collective intelligence. Now, if you want to make a great place or a great project, you might as well use the collective insights. That then gets you into this whole notion of how do you do that? What sort of methods? How do people communicate and so on? How do you consult people? How do you co-involve them and so on? Now, some people might say, look, cut the crap. Let's just do what we want. Now, okay, sometimes that works, could work, could become a good project, but often it doesn't. But if you're trying to keep things, in a sense, more resilient in the sense of people feeling they co-own it, it's better to go to these slightly more difficult process of trying to get people involved. The other thing is absolutely clear, is that in terms of collective intelligence, we're simply using a fraction of what could be there. Now, many people will say, oh, what are you talking about? 90% of people are completely uninterested in getting involved. That may be true, but it's also, we've not tried out to see what they've got. And if you've been habitually your voice has not been heard for centuries, then of course you're likely to say, oh, let me just do some good consumption and stuff like that and forget about all of this. So there is a hope in what, what I'm talking about. And what I'm really trying to focus on is people's better selves. And when you talk about people's better selves, that cuts across all class divisions and stuff like that, because of clearly so much could be um, given and provided by people. I find it always interesting. You know, I'm very curious and nosy, and I'm always asking people, what do they do? And you find lots of people who seem to be completely disengaged, and suddenly you discover in their private life they're doing these incredible things. I don't know. You might call it a hobby or something like that. It could be anything from running a triathlon to, I don't know, making stained glass massive windows or something, all of which are showing the expression of, 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 of people. So the main drift, I think, of what I've been talking about you could use the phrase, it's an empowerment agenda in, 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 in general. And I just feel that there are more opportunities out there. People should be given th these opportunities. Now, for me personally, it's very important, just in my personal work, to always do a project. To do a project which is a problem which we I may or may not help be part of solving, I don't know. But that's where I always 
have always over the last 30 years says, I just want to be a critical friend to the project I'm working with, which is part of saying you as the insider know a lot. I as an outsider might know something different. Is the inside and the outside, if we look at it holistically, does that frame, could it frame a solution? And so when I write these books, a few of them are very fat and big, but I've done this series of short ones, nine or so, is I'm just trying to highlight an area, but I'm also trying to reflect back. And by writing these books, one of the, 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 the things for me is it's out of my mind. It's I put it on the paper. It may not be perfect. It certainly isn't perfect. But what it means and allows you is then to think about, okay, I've opened some space out. I put that aside. What next? Where? And a few years ago, you know, I began writing six, seven years ago about the nomadic world, which, of course, many of us know about. But what I was trying to link it together, and I wrote this book called The Civic City in a Nomadic World. And in one sentence, what that book is about, where do I belong when everything is on the move? Now, one of the interesting things there, you could say, OK, I get it. I mean, you're from Sao Paulo. You're living in Berlin, as an example. So you're two things. You've got an identity as a Brazilian Sao Paulo identity. You've got a bit of a Berlin identity and so on. And the same is for me. So I think a lot of what I'm talking about is really a reflection sort of on myself. I know I'm generalizing, but in reality, why do I write this? Well, because it's partly my own problem. Where do I belong when I'm on the move? And obviously through COVID, I probably moved less, which was very valuable. And I, I, I think we shouldn't neglect the sort of personal, and that's a lot. I talked about blind spots before. Uh, another blind spot, I think, is really seeing the city through the senses. So, and that again is about how do I feel about it? What does it feel like when I walk here and do this? And I think we try to make things far too objective and neglect this, this personal thing that motivates people. And that I think is 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 a big issue. Yeah, that's really fascinating. But I think what's really really cool about it is that, in one hand, you are like really being sensitive about all this, um, all this like intangible or like subjective ways of interpreting what this sort of environment, the city, and the identity of of. of of being in creative or being in this environment means. But on the other hand, I feel like, and this has to do with also this like uh, accepting and embracing non-fixed points and embracing that things are complex and just trying to digest that in different ways. But then on the other hand, I feel like, for example, with the Creative Cities Index, then you're also like building a bridge into like, okay, yes, it is all like, it's very complex. And, but how do you inform uh, politicians and how do you inform policymakers in ways that they, they need the, 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 the uh, data, data points that are fixed, in, at least in comparison to others, cities mm -hmm. or other mm -hmm. places to be able to actually justify the decision, right? And I think like being able to bridge those two sides, I think that makes it uh, very unique and very powerful. Well, it's it, uh, interesting you bring up the Creative City Index, which, uh, in fact, we were lucky that we've had a long-term relationship with Bilbao, and they sort of challenged us and asked us the question, something called Bilbao Metropoly 30, which is a sort of future-thinking entity, and they said, could you measure the comprehensive creativity of a city? And with my colleague, Jonathan Himes, we then worked out a method. Again, nothing is perfect. Um, but what that's based on is four clusters with sort of 10 domains, which we analyze in different ways. The first is how do you nurture potential? What are the conditions there? You know, how open is the place? What's the talent landscape like, the learning landscape? The second is what are the enabling conditions which are to do with the political frameworks, their strategies, strategic agility and so on. Thirdly, how do you exploit and harness 
these potentials that may be there and the various tangible and intangible resources and how do you generate innovations from it and how can you communicate to the world and fourthly how is the lived experience of a place you know how distinctive are the facilities there and all of that sort of stuff and in doing that what i find quite interesting is that in a sense everybody is an expert about their own place and what we do is you know we do interviews online surveys read reports do lots of stuff and we've now done it in the meantime in 30 cities now in the end you might say it's very trivial because we then end up with a score and we have one which means you're dreadful 10 that you're so fantastic that nobody is and so you get a score let's say you get five and you think oh that's average that's meaningless well for us it's not so much the score it's what was the conversation in it and the diversities of opinions about assessing that score because people continually think differently and so what we're trying to do is bring out these differences but then to try and see what the common threads are or key themes that might be a gap or, 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 or a potential. And the key point about it is to generate a strategic conversation where you might say, OK, you're a 5 or 5.3 or something. How do you become a 6.3? What are the qualities of being that next level? What would you need to do to get from there to this new point? And that people have found quite useful. And particularly what they've also found useful is having conversations across disciplines because most of so often people speak in their own boxes you know social media has created more echo chambers than ever and so we're back to this point that you never get sort of collective insights or collective views um which again may be conflictual but those are precisely the target of making a place or solving a, pl a place's a problem and, and making it, it, it better. So that, that's what the Creative City Index is about. And we've done it in Adelaide, Taipei, Helsinki, Mannheim, Bilbao, obviously, and many other places. It takes more than five minutes to do this, by the way. You have to really engage and be in the place. You have to co-live the place in some sense. Um, so there we are, Pedro. And that's really interesting. So when we are now transitioning and thinking about all of these points of like, okay, there's these intangible ways of perceiving the city, the feelings, uh, the transformations that we have inside of our identity, the personal bias, and all of this that kind of like play into, into the research. Uh, then we were talking about the index and i think you have this project called they call the digitalized city and i think like just like thinking about like the next generation of cities and all these topics around like uh, machine learning ai and how how data actually plays a role in this like feedback loop of like how this like organism evolves and i wanted to just get a bit of like your insights in there well i mean there are a lot of people thinking about that so i'm not sure that i've got the biggest and the best insights in the world but i did write a book about what the impact of the digitalized city is and i think we're back there to to a couple of key themes one of it is who controls the data we all know that you know what is my my data identity who is defining the algorithms and all of that so there's that issue which again is is effectively self-empowerment and so on and there's lots of obviously legal work uh, uh, done on that i mean clearly the promise of the digitalized city is uh, is is immense you know from feedback loops you know i don't know that at a simplistic level oh there's a crack in the road and it's dangerous and i just on my mobile tell the city council there's something there and they respond immediately and, and things like that so there's lots of stuff about sensorizing the city which then becomes a sort of communications device i mean the city already is a communications device here it's adding the sort of digital digital to it so i think we know 
there, there, there's immense potential. But I think we're back to this question, my data, whose data and all of that, who is controlling that, which is, which is a sharp thing. The other thing is really, and I think the digital turn through COVID, you know, being on Zoom, etc., highlighted it. You know, obviously the possibilities were fantastic and it enabled us to do things. But when we suddenly then went back to being able to sometimes actually physically meet someone, to hug them, to whatever, to touch them, you know, just to feel, hey, you're another human being, that is a different dimension. Now, all of us are aware of uh, extended reality, uh, virtual reality and all of that. And that may do things, you know, when I have virtual reality headsets on, I have to say, sometimes I get a headache, but it's sort of quite nice. But will I want to be there all the time? And here, I think another issue comes in, which will be sharpened by increased digitization, because many of the things that are happening are sort of quite intention which is really our attachment or detachment from nature. And clearly, that's a big question, because when you suddenly can touch the grass, touch the soil, and I'm not trying to sound too romantic here, you suddenly get a completely different feeling from that other one. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, you can get techno-obsessed, I'm involved in co-curating something called a Moby Summer to, to do with mobility. And here we've really tried to shift the debate in this thing that happens in Lisbon, Cascais, in Portugal, away from just talking about autonomous vehicles, electric cars, all of which has digital stuff in it, as you well know. Um, but we're trying to say, let's shift the debate and say, what is mobility? Actually, Mobility is a driver for human development. It's about creating opportunities, conveniences and things like that, that you can go from A to B and all of that. But it's about your potential to be the best you can be. And then the car, the scooter, the whatever is just one of the devices. So it's a subsidiary thing. So one of our key themes, and I talked about this quite a bit, is mobility justice. You know, you talk about Brazil and, uh, you know, and I've been to some of the favelas in, in Sao Paulo and you just think there again, what sort of mobility do they have? Or in Rio, when they did the cable cars, you could say, actually, the cable car was an incredible vehicle that allowed people to get into work more quickly and things like that. So a lot of this is, 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 is about uh, a shifting uh, uh, debates. And within it, I'm certainly not against digitization, but I just think we just need to be careful. I mean, I can think of, you know, various things. I always love Helsinki at this point. I mean, I remember one of my friends, he could look at the council meeting from his home and sort of see the papers that the councillors were referring to as they were making a decision. Now, that wouldn't be possible without the digital world. Or there used to be a deputy mayor of Helsinki who was called the Twitter mayor, and he had incredible Twitter followers, and he ran everything through Twitter, and it was so much more effective than sort of going through lots of processes. He just sent a message, someone responded, and, 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 and so on. So robots, you talked about robots. Okay, yes, right. But again, I'm not sounding terribly insightful. Um, it's not everything. I mean, basically, human beings are social animals. And there is something about pheromones and all of these things in terms of human proximity that has something really, really important in it. I mean, I may, if you don't mind, just mention a few things that I think is quite important because I'm working with the BMW Foundation on something called their Rise Cities program. I sort of chair their committee. Rise stands for Resilient, Intelligent, High Data, Sustainable and Equitable. And in working out their vision, I was just pointing out that there are quite a few things we should incorporate in our thinking if we're thinking about where we live and how we live 
ideally together. Um, and one of them is to embed ecological thinking. That's quite clear. That links us back to nature and so on. The other thing is to see cities as a commons, the urban commons. We know about the commons in general. And here Bologna, with its declaration of 2014 about the urban commons, is, is fantastic. The third, back to your data point, is the importance of civic tech and how that works, which is more than, as you well know, people coming from civic worlds, communicating with governments and so on, creating feedback loops, etc. Fourth, this cultural understanding that I mentioned before. Then fifth, the mobility issue I just mentioned a second ago. And there, there, there are others. But one of the most important ones I, I, I finalized with on in this piece of work was, was just the whole thing about governance. And here, back to the creative bureaucracy, the creative bureaucracy didn't come out of nowhere. There are obviously others who are thinking about government reform but or bureaucratic reform. But so often it was the model like, new public management, which basically says, OK, whatever the private sector is doing is the model we should take. Well, OK, but we have different criteria. What is success when you talk about a civic project? What is success when you talk about the public interest? It's not about profit maximizing necessarily, although we all want to be effective and efficient. And then that moved, as you know, to other things like public private partnerships, stakeholder management, these other words. And now very much more, you know, you're governing for the people, which needs to bring in these other interests, civic and so, so, so on. And so the creative bureaucracy is part of, in a sense, that movement that involves living labs. There are 400 or so around the world or 500. I forgot. I don't know anymore. Um, and these are just experimentation zones. And what's so important, if you're a company, of course, you say, have you got an R&D department? Have you got an experimentation department? Well, you rarely have it in terms of cities. So you need, obviously, to have more of that in cities. Be allowed to fail, not because you want to fail, but not everything works. And OECD, the Office for Public Sector Innovation, Vinova, the Swedish Innovation Agency, Citra, the Finnish one, are all sort of working a bit in this field. And what we're really trying to do is be a platform to bring some of these things together and to celebrate those great people. And we always say creative bureaucrats and their allies. I mean, you, to some extent, are an ally. You want to make wherever you are better, but you don't want to do it necessarily in the traditional way because you feel there are limitations. So, so that gives you a bit of a context about that. Yeah, really amazing. I mean, just to... I mean, yes, I mean, just to this digital world, I mean, I don't know if you know, we also work a lot in sort of like VR and immersive multiplayer environments. And I agree. I mean, if you touch the grass there, or if you touch the grass in the real world, let's put it that way, that's even like a, a, a chemical reaction and like a, it's physics. It's just, it's not the same substance. But yes, there are very interesting possibilities in terms of, of mobility like uh, this virtual mobility of just being able to be there and do things so i think yes this this digital the digitalization is uh, it's very is it, it's very important but yes there's so many other elements to it and i mean just to touch upon two other points i mean i've been part of a network in the bmw foundation very close to to to, to them in the past right now not so much but like i'm still part of this network so it's uh, interesting to hear that and um, also being very part of this whole commons discussion, like with all those uh, commons groups that uh, we've participated on some of their retreats and so on. And just like, it's a very interesting idea. And then we say, you talk about digitalization and like using civic tech and you're talking about like city as a commons, right? And then uh, uh, like, and then you're talking about governance, like, these are very, very big topics. And I guess like I've been looking in my whole life how how they how those things will come together in a cohesive way that it actually empowers uh, the cities to change. And I think another topic that I think 
relates a bit to the, to the commons and maybe you can comment a bit on this is the topic of ownership right because commons is a form of ownership but like i like the definition i i find it like there are there's a good definition of the commons but like what are what is this like ownership slash governance slash civic tech How, what are the experiments and what are the things that kind of could provide us because specifically in the ownership topic, I mean, I dealt and collaborated with the Edith Marion Foundation, which is also dealing, I'm also part of a board of an organization in Brazil where we take like real estate out of speculation. So I and dealt with like this uh, sort of investment fund that I helped to, to, to initiate that invests in companies that change their ownership structure. So I guess it's very hard to kind of, if you don't touch upon these points to solve the solution, especially in cities, as you, as because of the real estate speculation and so on, and I wanted to just understand if you have any vision for for what those how those topics come together and what that could be. Yeah, I mean, w one thing is clear: as the market on its own will not create the things we seem to collectively desire, which to feel empowered and all of these things. And basically city development is property development if you let the market rule it. So this is where we come back to the public interest. And therefore, of course you're right that we need various other forms of ownership and we need to take things out of the speculation market. Because you're in Berlin, you will know we're using Berlin just now for a moment as an example, that various foundations, Arben, Drope, Marion Foundation and others, have helped and tried to ke take key properties out of the speculation market. Um, there are other examples, you know, social housing examples, or one that's 500 years old, very famous, called the Fuggerei in Augsburg, which already 500 years ago, and just had its celebration, was trying to do the same thing. So there's no doubt that that, that, that that is going to be one of the major battles as we continue, because this will be resisted incredibly, because we've sort of embedded the idea that there is no other way, and private property rights are king or queen. Um, now, I think what we're saying is we're not saying you can't own an apartment or anything like that, or a house, what we're saying is you need other alternatives that through time can be guaranteed. And one of the problems is that quite often, for example, in the UK, there was a lot of social housing. It was sold to the tenants, very cheap. And then a vast majority of it was then just then shoved into speculation because people sold the properties and we're, we're back to square one. So the issue is really trying to do that over time and to find ways. And this is so difficult because we're in, we might want to overcome capitalism as it exists, but we're still in a capitalist world. So how does someone who's in this nomadic world, it could be a lecturer. I'm just thinking of a friend of mine, you know, who moved from Hamburg to Vienna. How can he in that move? And if he's going to move again, have some sort of asset. So, combining the idea of being able to have some sort of asset value with at the same time reducing the speculative power of that becomes absolutely key and here we're back to interest uh, interesting incentives and regulations and this is where we need creativity that's why i mean i don't know all the answers obviously but that's why i'm talking about civic creativity within the creative bureaucracy because these are very unglamorous areas which actually our focus should be. The, not, the, the things that are glamorous is not necessarily the latest fashion. Am I going to wear red today or black? But these unglamorous areas, like also procurement, are incredibly important. Because within that spectrum you just talked about ownership, which I think is absolutely essential, is also what are the things we're procuring? So you could be procuring housing in different ways rather than saying there's some massive organization that, you know, and it's, you know, rules seems to be quite good. 
But what about letting 50 young people procure a new housing project? And what about asking them, what would that look like? You know, you're younger than me. Perhaps the sort of configuration of a building, the aesthetics of a building, all of that, you may have completely different views. Because when you look at so much of things like housing, it all looks the bloody same. But it could look different. It could be different in many other ways uh, as well. So that area is really, for me, one of the key realms for creative thinking and acting, of course. And based on all your experience and conversations and obviously you're connected with so many people in the world, like what are the key points that we should like look into while trying to think about empowering like the creativity and empowering our cities? Well, I think we're back to the point you started from. I mean, we're again back to call it creativity, call it inventiveness, call it the imagination. And Jeff, again, Jeff Malden talks about the imagination crisis now, which is all part of the same movement uh, that, that I'm to some, that I'm involved in. And what I think is really important, when we pick up the key elements, and you've touched upon many of them, the way you make the best out of the digital the question of ownership, the other things I mentioned, the commons, all of that. When you look at them together, they represent different values when you see them together. And that implies having a different mindset uh, if you want to move towards these values, different behaviours and all of that. And because it's about values, mindsets, behaviours and so on, the transition we're talking about is actually the biggest cultural project of our time and together this cultural project is part of imagining that planet b of what it could be like because you have to show a picture of it to some extent because people you know can't see it and that's why you need practical examples which show and bed these different things and because you're in berlin you could say holzmarkt nobody's saying holzmarkt's perfect but it certainly looks different from your average uh, high-rise apartment development on, on the spray. So you, having that picture, that story of what could be, is absolutely important, I think, for me, bringing these elements together. Now, I know, of course, we need to get Planet A right as well. And what's so difficult is, of course, we're in the transition to create the transition. And all these value systems are conflicting with each other. And I think one of the most important things is, is for all of us collectively to be more confident that we're right, to be able to stand up. And it's quite interesting. I did a talk uh, at Holtzmark the other day on their 10-year celebration, uh, which was called The Relevance of Resistance. And funnily enough, when it was founded 10 years ago, I also did a talk called The Relevance of Resistance. It was the same talk, but it was different because I felt very different 10 years later. Whereas 10 years ago, I just sort of said, The Relevance of Resistance? When I did this a couple of months ago, I said, The Relevance of Resistance? And say, yes, we have to resist because the forces, the vested interests that are against us are very powerful and they divide and rule. And to some extent, we've got to act in a non-negotiable way. You know, we, to some extent, demand this. And then you get lots of governance questions like, uh, is protest okay? Well, I think it has to be in some circumstances. Do you know what I mean? And do you break the rules? Well, in some instances, you have to if the rules are messing up the world, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So that's where I stand uh, now. And so to some extent, like all of us, we change uh, as time moves on. Fascinating, fascinating. Yes. Yes. And I mean, it's really important to highlight all those projects and empower them and make sure that there is like a conversation between them so that those best practices are also passed across. I mean, there is one initiative that we started 
uh, a year ago called um, um, Land um, Land Purpose Forum, which is also just bringing together all our people that are and projects that are dealing with this land ownership in a different way. And we have had incredible conversations across the world and just just to see the commonalities and differences there are between the struggle of those uh, projects that are trying to resist in in this context, uh, it can be very helpful. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, I suppose we probably covered quite a lot of ground. I don't know if you want to ask me another question. Um, no, I, I think this is fascinating. Disposal. Yeah, this is fascinating. I, I'm really thankful uh, to you to for having taken the time. And I think that it's very, yeah, it was very inspiring just to, just to go up a bit, touch a bit upon all those different topics that are like you have a broad spectrum of f around this sort of like ur urban topic, which is so fascinating. And uh, yes, it was very, very interesting uh, to me and I think also to, to the listeners as well. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. No worries and good luck with everything, with everything you're doing. Yes, let 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 you let us know if you're in Berlin. Let me know if you're in Berlin. I'm happy to to meet, have you for coffee. Would be great. Look forward to the coffee. <laughs> All right. Amazing. See you soon. See you soon. Take care. Okay.